Well, I tell you, I couldn't, God couldn't have picked better songs this mm. morning. I didn't listen to them last night. I just picked up the ones I felt like he wanted me to have. And I'm like, wow, those are really good. Yes, they were. They were <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> couldn't have introduced that better. Thank you, Father. Um, the, uh, the outlines that Terry kind of passed out, I'm, I'm even having some type of reservations about even handing them out, but you're welcome to give them out. Just don't depend on them. Um, so, uh, I, I just, I don't know if I'm going to follow the outline in that order. Those points will be covered, but, um, just whether or not it's going to, it's yeah, whether it's going to be there specifically like that, I don't entirely know, but so. It was my, at Terry's request that we had, that I have something that might can help you follow along with the key points, and so I've been trying to do that, but to be honest with you, I don't know how well it's going to work. So, uh, uh, thank you, Father God, that you are here, Amen. and that you are going to speak to us. Again, he speaks beyond the words of a mere man, because it's not really, it's important, the vessel, but not nearly important as the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, he is the only true teacher. We don't just say that as a, a statement of, of um, fake humility. It is the honest to God truth. Um, even those who have a gift of teaching, Paul says, what do you have that wasn't given to you? Amen. So uh, we, we want to honor him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You are so glorious. Um, as we continue in this chapter, of course, we are starting uh, the, today in verses 34 through the end, hopefully. Um, uh, the, the point, the overarching point, though, as we continue in four, chapter 14, it's all about decency and order because the Spirit of God, uh, remember, we, we, we start talking about... Um, this because we're talking about the saints being the ministers. Uh, it's not. It's not the pastors. It's not the prophets. It's not the uh, evangelists. It's 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 not them. Um, I think a great example of that has been uh, the death of Billy Graham and the way that it seems to have impacted the body of Christ. And to be honest with you, as as great of a man as he was, it should have been little more than a blip on our radar, because the bottom line is that. The reason why he's carried so much importance is because of the fact that the body's not doing anything, and they rely upon people like that to do everything. Are you following me? And that's not the way it should be. Uh, in many respects, people like that had to do so much because the body was doing nothing. And God's like, that's not my design. It's not my purpose. They were there, and they are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and they are the ones that are supposed to be doing the touching. They're the supposed to be the one, uh, like the early church, you know, Father God, lift, um, uh, we pray that you uh, you uh, pour out your spirit on us, and and that through your spirit, we lift that, we put, put out the hand of Jesus Christ and lay it on the nations that they might be healed and, and bring them into the kingdom of God. That was the prayer of the general church. Not the pastors, not the prophets, not the teachers. It was the church that was praying that kind of thing. You know, use us to go out and reach the lost. Use us to minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, you know, we started talking about spiritual gifts, which are the things that the Spirit influences our hearts with power and with authority to speak into each other's world and to reconcile hearts to God. Amen? And But then we talked about how the fact the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He's only going to talk in a certain way, and He's always going to talk about Jesus. Amen? Yes. And, and, that, and that when He talks about Jesus, His point is always going to be to glorify the Father through the Son, yeah. right? Yes. But but that you always glorify the Son, and by glorifying the Son, you do glorify the Father, amen? Yeah. And it, because it's a family portrait, which we talked about on Wednesday with the menorah as a living example of it, um, uh, uh, God, Jesus can't be glorified unless you and I are glorified. <laughs> Everything depends upon the other. To the degree that you and I take on the nature of Christ and therefore the glory of Christ, the character, the honor, the majesty, the nobility of Christ, when we do that, we honor our head, who is Christ. And when Jesus is honored, the Father is honored. Amen. 
It, it just has this, this ricochet all the way through the body of Christ, all the way through um, uh, the Godhead, doesn't it? And so, you know, these, uh, these, these truths are very important, but then when you got to chapter 14, he's saying, you know, there are right things and wrong things. When you're ministering, there are right ways and wrong ways to do everything. And so this chapter is very concentrated on doing things in decency and in order, isn't it? Yeah. Right? So um, as we press and progress this morning through these last few verses, let's lay down, before we get started, some basic points which up to this moment, we've already all agreed to. One of them is that Paul in this letter is not just addressing the assembly of believers in Corinth, but has upon several occasions clearly stated that he is saying what he is saying, not only to the church in Corinth, but to the church worldwide. Uh, you can see that example in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, when it says, to the church. I mean, he starts off his letter with this. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with, everybody say the word with. with, with all who in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So even though the letter was written specifically to the Corinth, to the Corinthians, it was for the content of this letter applies to everyone who in every place names the name of Jesus. Uh, again, I told you last week that those words or any, anything, anything even remotely like those words don't appear in any other epistle that Paul wrote. Even though it was true of the other epistles. And, you know, the funny thing is that, that see, in the other epistles, we assume it's all to everybody. But it's amazing how in 1 Corinthians, because the sensitivity of the topics that are addressed in this book, there have been more Christians that have been led to the idea that, oh, well, that was just to them. In this, not in 2 Corinthians, though they'll buy all of that. But that whole 1 Corinthian thing, now, there's some passages in there that are just, that was just for that particular church. Which, is it any wonder that God went out of his way several times in this book alone, not in the, any of the other books, but in this book alone, to repeat himself about three different times what I'm saying is for all the church, everywhere, throughout time. And yet, with those verbal clues in this letter, people have still thought, well, that was probably just for that church. They would have never thought that if it came to the book of Ephesians. Would have never thought of that if it came to the book of Colossians, hold on there for a moment, or, or Thessalonians. But in this one book, they thank that. And yet in this one book is the only place God went out of his way to say that's not the case, it's not the case, it's not the case. So is, did God see something coming? Yes. Yeah? And did he already speak to it? Yes, he did. This is not just for the Corinthians. This is for the church in every place, in every time, world without end, period. So God has spoken. Have we agreed with that or not? Yes. Okay? Yes, Doris. Well, the thing is, he speaks through Paul. And people know that Paul is... You know, allowing God to speak through him. Mm -hmm. And he says in his word, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. Now, if forever is part of now, or now is part of forever, there's nothing different. It should apply. That's, That's right. Absolutely. I mean, there are some cases in Scripture where God will say something that is specifically to a group of people. But in those cases, he says so right in the text. You know. It's super clear, right? Now, it's not always super clear 2,000 years later, but if you're a studier, it'll be clear. Right, and and we already determined because we're not going to be people who are ashamed. We're studiers, aren't we? Yes. We're Bereans. Yes. We do not have any reason to be ashamed before God because we rightly divide the Word of God by studying it. Yes. Right. So, uh, and and you guys are, are Bereans also in the second case, and that you don't just hear with readiness what I'm teaching or what other people teach you, but when you go home, you spend time in the Scriptures to see whether these things are true. so. True. Amen. Whether they're true. Yes. Um, if you don't do that, you're not being noble. Right. Paul said that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word of God with all readiness, but then when they got home, they studied the scriptures for themselves to see whether those things were so. Yes. Amen? So uh, we're going to be noble people. Amen? Yes. That, that was a, that, very good. Amen. We're Amen. noble people, yes. aren't we? Yes, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. So uh, Paul um, is concerned also in this chapter about edification in the church. He's concerned with order in the church. He's concerned with procedures in the church. And Paul is speaking the commandments of Jesus to the church in this letter. It's very, very important. So have we agreed to those points? Yes? Okay. Now, it's important because if it applies, 
um, if, if this these things applied all the way up to now in this letter, it also applies to everything else we're going to read in the letter. And that's an extreme. That's an extremely important thing that we have to have tacked down before we go further. So let's read our passage once through. And then we're going to start looking at some of the key points, just like we did last week, starting in verse 34. It says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it to you that it only reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are, in fact, the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him remain ignorant. Or in other words, if someone, the wording really says, as I told you um, much earlier when we first started this chapter, if anyone ignores what I'm writing, let them be ignored, is really the way it reads in the Greek. If anyone ignores this, let them be ignored, Right? Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done in decency and in order. So clearly, that's he repeats that um, that that uh, type of a mantra all the way through the chapter. The decency and order is the rule of the day, isn't it? Now, remember that the first rule of interpretation is that God will not contradict <coughs> His own word. Bless you. Right. Yes. First rule of interpretation of God's of the word is that God doesn't contradict Himself. So, and, and one of the second, may not be the, exactly the second rule, but one of the top ones is that you interpret all scripture by other scripture, right? Amen? Uh, things that might seem a little bit obscure or might seem a little bit hard to understand, we interpret them in light of things that we know for absolute fact. Amen? Amen. So and that, that's a very good rule for interpretation. Now, does the word of God ever allow women to speak in church? In other places? Yeah. Yes. yes, it does. Yeah. So clearly, we have to interpret this passage through the light of places that other places that we know are very clear. But let's look at these other passages and see what they actually say. So let's first turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm being very careful here um, to read this directly. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 8 and going to read through verse 14. Only part of it we're going to talk about right now. We will talk about more of it later. So we're going to be referring back to this passage later because it addresses two different issues that we have to address at two different times. Okay. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8, reading to the verse 14, and again, we're looking for, did Paul ever say it's okay for women to speak in church? Is there a case where he did? Well, in verse 8, it says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Who? Men. 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 That would be distinct from women. women. There you go. Men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now this is going to fly right by the average reader. But if you look up the words, in like manner also refers back to the thing he just said. In other words, without repeating himself, he says, I want the women to pray everywhere and in every place with lifted up holy hands. Well, every place would also include the assemblies, wouldn't it? Yes. It would, wouldn't it? I mean, it has to. It can't be every place. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think Paul was very, very inti uh, um, intimately aware of his doctrine enough to, uh, to th have it in his head that if there was an exception of in the church, he said he would have said, except in the churches, because, you know, that's not permitted to them. But he didn't say that, did he? He said, also, in like manner, I want all the women to pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands. But this next part, the reason why he brings up these next conditional statements is because what it looks like for a man to pray in public, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, and what it looks like for a woman to do the same is not the same thing. Praying is the same, but the way they do it is different. He says, when a woman does it, she needs to adorn herself in a way that she is honoring her heads, those who are above her in authority. It'd be very much like if someone were to speak for a company without first saying to them that they're representing that company in a way that honors that company. Are you following? Yeah. Like if a, if a company, now this was more important back in, in the day because all lines, everything's up for grabs in our day. Everything's up for grabs. Um, 
sadly. But there were lines in the past, and they were good lines. They weren't, uh, sometimes they were overly stringent, overly anal, but they still had a purpose and a place. There was a day where if you were a CEO of a major corporation, you could not have good, uh, get, uh, stood up and given a speech representing that company or answered questions in an interview with a, uh, with a, uh, um, a, a newscaster dressed in, in clothes that you just did the lawn in. They would have never allowed that. Because of the fact that you're not representing this company with the dignity that they expect out of its employees. Right. Are you following? Yes. There's a right way and a wrong way to do certain things, right? In the same way, it would be at least out of place for, for a person who's being interviewed who does have a lawn business to be standing there, sitting next to their dirty mower in a three-piece suit. It's out of place. It doesn't really represent their business. I mean, he's, rep he's almost representing himself as, when I come to mow your yard, I'm coming in a three-piece suit. And you know darn well he doesn't. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's right ways and wrong ways to represent what you do. And this passage makes it very clear that women, in every place and in every time, represent their head. And then he goes on in another place and tells us who their head is. Okay? But that a woman has got to dress in a way that is both modest and with propriety is important. If they do not do that, they ought not be praying. Not because what they're saying is not good, not because God does not welcome their words before his throne. He most certainly does. He not only welcomes it, he requires it. Amen? Yes. But at the same time, this is a right and a wrong way. Amen? Yes. You don't present yourself in a way that is... Now, by that, we don't mean that by today's standards, uh, or not so much today, again, today has no standards, but uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, you don't come to church unless you're dressed, you know, to the hill. And that kept a lot of people from coming to church. And, and to be honest with you, the early church didn't act that way. The early church, a lot of these people came to church after working all day. Yeah. Right? It was a very practical thing. They got around because they were family. There was no need for pomp and circumstance, right? Yeah. And, and, and in cases when it did happen, Paul addressed it. The Corinthian church uh, was living in an area where even the poor people were richer than a lot of other people around the world. Corinth was an affluent city, had a lot of money. You can see that. You don't have to, again, don't take my word for it. Read through 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, particularly if you pay attention to chapters 8, 9, 10 in both books. And you'll see that Paul addresses the wealth of the city and the wealth in this church. They, they had more money than most people did. And, 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 the, and, and to be fair, the people who were Christians in Corinth were probably middle-income to lower-income people in that city. But middle to low-income in Corinth was upper echelons in Rome. Yeah. Are you following? Yeah. So, I mean, all things are relative. I mean, to, you, the poor people that live on the street in America are better off than... Uh, middle-income people in other nations, aren't they? So it's yeah. all relative, isn't it? Yeah. So um, he was telling. So it, even with these people, they were coming to church and they were coming, you know, flaunting their, you know, what we would have called our Sunday best. And it was all about pay attention to me, look at me. And they were peacocking, strutting. And this was not probably just relegated to women alone, but it was more of a woman problem than it was a man problem. Okay, and that's traditionally been the case. If you don't believe me, go to a department store and see which clothing department is larger. Yes, <laughs> right. in every store, yeah, right. isn't it true? Yeah. The shoe department. You've got one aisle for men, and about twelve for women. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because they know that this is an issue for women, and men are like, you know, just give me two pairs of shoe. I just don't want to have, you know, I don't want to be barefoot. That's really all I'm looking for here. Now, it's getting worse because men are becoming a lot more effeminate. But um, in the real world, where, where gender lines actually do have a meaning, by and large, it's, it's, that's typically the way it is. Are there exceptions to every rule? Yes, but all it does is prove the rule. Okay? So now, um, let's look at this again. I, I wanted to give that as a caveat as to where we were going so you can understand why he brings it up. He says, in like manner also. So he's talking about, I want the women to pray in the same way with lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, but that it says women need to adorn themselves in modest apparel. Don't be showing too much, right? If you show too much, what are you doing? You're drawing attention to yourself. yourself. Yeah. Amen? Um, it says with propriety and moderation. That means that he's also saying you don't have to come looking like a bum, but at the same time, don't come looking like you're dressed to go into the Taj Mahal. I want you to just come, just don't, don't come to draw attention to yourself. Now, this is a big deal. Paul makes a real big deal about this, not only here, but in another place. 
that um, and and there's a reason for this, and we're going to see it as we progress through this that. It's in the purpose and the design of the woman to draw glory and bring glory back on her husband or on mankind in general if they're not married. Not to draw attention to themselves. So is it any wonder that the enemy has made it so that women make their appearance all about themselves? No, uh -uh. just like God intended man's authority over women to be a protection and a provision for them, is it any wonder that in most places around the world the enemy has distorted it into holding women under a subjective thumb? It's a distortion of what God designed. Amen? Amen. It's still what God designed, but it's a distortion of it. Are you following? And so he makes a big deal about this. He says, In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness. In other words, now he's not saying that you can't have that one or two really nice dresses or whatever it is that you go out to dinner in or whatever. He's not saying you can't own it. He's just saying when you come together in your assemblies, it should not be about debuting your latest thing you got from Fifth Avenue. In fact, you should have probably very few things from Fifth Avenue as women professing godliness. Why? Well, one of the reasons in, in the early church, that, like I said last week concerning buildings, they would have seen buildings as a waste of money. They would see it as, as monetary debt. Why support a building when there's people starving around the planet that have never heard this gospel? Why? They, would have, they would have looked at people like they had two heads if you were to build a cathedral to meet it. They would have thought, what are you talking about? And, and, and in the same way, for people to have to live, not not to have some nice things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. Bible's never against that. He says God gave us all things to enjoy, right? But there's also an overboard to this, where you've got way too much and you're spending too much on these things, and that's the same kind of money. That money that is being wasted could be put into the gospel. Amen. And so this was a very practical matter, which is why Paul attached it to if you profess that you're godly. You wouldn't do this anyway. Now, now are you, I hope you guys are seeing, just in your mind's eyes, just close your eyes, and in your mind's eye, look across the body of Christ at large in primary nations. Do you think that they really believe and adhere to these words that Paul said? What do you think? No, I don't think they do at all. And, and yet Paul said it's a condition of whether you're truly godly or not. Hello? Yeah. So would you say this is important stuff? Yes. Yes, Doris. What comes on our mind is that to come humbly before the Lord. Yes. Uh -huh. Pride aside, because it says holy, holy hands, that's without sin, without wickedness. Mm -hmm. And if you're prideful, that's that's not... <laughs> that's definitely not humble. It's not in the, that's, in yeah. the category. Of and, and, and again, this uh, because it runs completely opposite to the role. The role is to bring glory back on her husband or upon her father or his house, depending on whether or not she's still at her house or whether she's married, which in their day, that was the only way you weren't with your father's house, is if you were married. You brought, in other words, you brought glory back on your head, right? Uh, you represented well. You were not there to draw attention to yourself. I've given an illustration of this in the past, and uh, I'll make reference to it again in the future later on in the message, but... Um, You'll see this as well, again, not that long in our past. Um, and in my lifetime, I remember being a young man and going to, uh, we didn't go to too many parties and stuff like that, but some parties we did go to. And when you go to a party, a social party, a, a lot of times, if it wasn't just for fun, there was also a lot of meet and greet, which wound up being more about promoting your business than it was almost anything else. And what would wind up happening is the men would talk with one another and the women would be with them, but the women would often, they'd be in a, in a support role. They would be there putting as good of a light <coughs> on their husband, Bless. causing him to be shy, shown in the best light possible. They did not, they weren't flashy, they weren't showy, they didn't, you know, leave their husband in the dust and walk out and, and start shaking other men's hands and stuff like that. They were always with their husband, and they were helping present him to other people. They were playing a support role. They were being a, oh, I don't know, helper, right? And that, that was true of, of 
non people that weren't even born again. It was just the way society was, right? Because and and really around the world that still is true in most places where you have not developed the notion of freedoms to the point where everybody thinks, well, I can do whatever I want and forget you, which is, of course, where America is headed. And other places that are in first world countries have done that as well. But it says, in like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or costly clothing, um, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into the transgression. So the part that we're looking at right now is verse 8 and 9, where he says, uh, when, when he was addressing the, the right and the, the propriety of a woman praying in public. He wants them to do it. So clearly, already, we already know in 1 Corinthians 14, what he's saying there cannot be saying they can't pray. So silence must mean something other than what you would assume it means. Is everybody with me or not? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Let's look also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go ahead and turn there. And Terry, you had something. As we're turning, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 4. Yes, Terry. Um, just to closing off the topic of the, how we present ourselves as being a, a reflection back on our heads. Mm -hmm. Even during worship, I was thinking about that regarding our relationship with God and how yes. our lives are to be a reflection of, of when people look at us, people around us, that it shines back His glory. That's right. His His. It points to Christ. To Him and exalt Him. Yeah, we're not drawing attention to ourselves; we're drawing attention to Christ. It's just like the menorah, right? Well, exactly. That's where I was going with the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Was the thought of the the pure gold mm -hmm. that was on the walls that mm -hmm. was so beautiful, but at the same time, it reflected back. Mm -hmm. The light, mm -hmm. you know, and on, you know. It's, it's the way it should be. The light was cast from an, from an, the menorah forward, right, into the room. But then the room reflected that back at the menorah, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So so the candelabra, the menorah is not glorifying itself. It's glorifying its surroundings. But the surroundings not glorifying itself. It's glorifying the menorah. Are you following? It's I work for God and I serve him. But at the same time, Jesus came not to serve, to be served, but to serve. serve. It works both ways, doesn't it? Right? And, and that's what love is. Love always works for the benefit of the other. Amen? It's never focused on itself. Right? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting verse and 4 and reading verse 5 as well, it says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For it is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Now, the, these verses are referring to hair and not headpieces or hats or wigs or whatever. Go ahead down to verse 13 through 15 and we can see that he's talking about it. Of course, you can also already kind of deduce that because he says it's the same as if her head were shaved. We're talking about hair, not something you put on your head, right? But let's look at verse 13 through 15 just to clarify. It says, judge among yourselves. And, and by the way, verse 13 through 15 is an example of Paul talking about a cultural issue that was unique to Corinth. And we know that because of the words, okay? He says, judge among yourselves. Is it proper, proper, I'm saying, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, he's a, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, the wording here when it says, does not nature itself teach you, is a very unique phrase. Those of you who are studiers, which I believe all of you are, you might want to look it up later. The phrase there, does not nature itself teach you. If the phrase that he's saying here is, doesn't just the fact that we exist, we woke up in the morning, we're breathing air, and you can look out and see the birds in the sky and all that, doesn't that teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a shame to him? If it's really saying that, then we've got some real questions. Why is it then that it was not his hair but the hair cut that got Samson in, in trouble? God said, if you're going to honor me as a Nazarite, you can't cut your hair as a man. So clearly, this did not mean nature itself in general. If you look up the word nature there, it has two meanings. It does not, it means either, doesn't just nature itself, 
or does, or it means, or it could mean, based on the context, does not your immediate surroundings teach you this? The latter is what applies to Corinth. We already know that, number one, because, again, in the Old Testament, in order to be a Nazarite and honor God, you had to have long hair. So clearly, it couldn't be against nature. Because who made nature? God. God. And he's the one that said, if you're going to honor me as a Nazarite, no razor is to come upon your head. Right? As long as you're serving me, you don't cut your hair, period. And if they were serving him for years, their hair could get down pretty long. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then when now and when they, they fulfilled their vow, then they would shave their head and they'd go on. But clearly the long hair was not against nature. It couldn't have been. Because yeah. God's the one that created nature. Yeah. But it, so there had to be something about their natural surroundings in Corinth that it was a problem. Well, you got we already know this a long time ago. We talked about it a long time ago in Corinth. There's a, a subsection called Acre Corinth, and uh, they they had a very perverse religion there, and um, it was very sex based, um, and uh, women were were the priests in that religion, um, and men and women would prostitute themselves, and to differentiate themselves from other people in society, the women would shave their head, and the men would wear long hair. And that's how you knew they, they were a priest or a priestess of Acrocorinth. So Paul's saying, do you want to come into the church of God and look like a temple prostitute of another religion and raise your hand in prayer to God? Does not, doesn't your immediate surroundings tell you there's something wrong with this picture? That's all he's saying, right? Now, Paul makes a big deal that if a woman does pray, she needs to have a symbol of authority on her head. What that symbol was, was a cultural issue. In America, it could be a ring. In, um, in um, Corinth, it was, if you, got, if you got your head shaved, you need to be wearing a hat until your hair grows out. And men, if you got long hair, you need to cut it. Because in your society, you're saying, I'm a temple prostitute of a, poor, of a, of a, um, of a, um, a pagan religion. If you come to Christ, separate yourself from the world. Whatever that happens to mean, Right? If there's some places around the world where, um, where uh, uh, it, there, was a, there was a time and a day where, um, where uh, in America, where if you had a tattoo, people just thought that you were a terrible person. Yeah. Or if I had a tattoo and I had come to Christ, I would have found some way of them putting some type of a skin tattoo color on top of my tattoo to hide it as much as possible. Not because I'm ashamed of it, but because of that I don't want to be associated with my old life. Mm. Now, in today's generation... It's not attached to a negative spin like it used to be. So it's not a big deal. But there was a time where this person came into a church and they had tattoos up and down their arm. The first thought would have been, this person is probably not a godly person. And they would have probably been right in the 90 percentile. That's not true today. Are you following? So this is a lot like that. Yes, Terry. Oh, I thought you, you were raising your hand. So he says, judge among yourself is it proper. So he's talking about hair here. As far as the covering. Are you guys following or not? Okay. So Paul is again allowing for women to pray here and to prophesy both, right? Yeah. But under authority. In both places, Paul makes it issue that there needs to be an obvious token that this woman, if she's praying or prophesying, does so under authority. Are you following? Yeah. This is In both places, it's clear that that's the case. Okay, but are they allowed to do that in church? Clearly they are. Yes? Yeah. Everybody is with me, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so with these two examples under our belt, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 and 35. The two verbal elephants in these verses are the word silent and the word speak. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 and 35, the two big words that we're looking at are the word silent and the word speak. Now, this is not the first time these words appear in this chapter. If you want to back up to verse 28 and to verse 30 in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 28 and 30, we will see the word silent and speak again. It says, but if there, in verse 28, but if there is no interpreter, meaning for the person who speaks in tongues, let him keep silent. silent. It's the same word. <clears throat> let your women keep silent in the church. It says if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent. silent. Same word. Exact same word. Right. And let him speak to himself and to God. Verse 30. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. 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 Same word. 
as let your women keep silent in the church. Now, does anyone here believe for a moment that this means that the silence is all-encompassing and for all time under all circumstances? No. No, it's very clear. In these first two verses, it's very obvious there's a circumstance in the situation in which silence is preferred. Well, in this third one we're talking about with women, the same is true. It's just not as obvious. It is obvious in the Greek. It's not so obviously obvious in the English translation. So while this word, now the word silent literally means silent. It means close your mouth. That's what it means. Okay? Yeah. Now, um, there, it has a dual meaning. Externally, it means you've been doing this. I want you to do that. Right? Okay? Externally. Internally, it means Take a chill pill. Yeah. Cool. Maintain your calm. You notice, before he gets to the issue of women keep signing the churches, he tells us that, you know what, prophecy doesn't overpower you. You don't have to talk. Right? right. I mean, he says that just before bringing this issue up about women. Mm -hmm. Let your women keep silent in the church. Right? It's right after he got done talking about prophecy judging prophecy, and that just because the spirit of prophecy comes on you, it does not make you prophesy. You have control over your tongue, right? <sighs> Calm down. That means you're supposed to. Uh, maintain some inner peace here. Yeah. Don't be controlled, but be in control in that regard. Now, in control for us means submitted to the spirit, not, you know, grasping for control. But in other words, it means when, this, when the gifts come over you, what is that, the exact wording there concerning prophecy? It says, because the spirit of prophecy is subject to the Prophet. prophets. Yeah. It's not the other way around. The prophet is not subject to the gift of prophecy. Yeah. The gift of prophecy is subject to the prophet. You don't have to give it. You have control, right? right. Yeah. Maintain peace, inner peace, all right? Yeah. Now, we need to find out who is Paul addressing by the words, your women. Yes, uh-huh. Prophecy is gift, right? It is a gift. And if God gives you prophecy mm -hmm. and you don't give it, there are times when it's appropriate. We we addressed that last week, but um um we did we addressed a lot of stuff, so I, um I'll I'll mention that again. There are times when the the spirit of God has come on a group of people, and uh, there are times when God will uh, come on a group of people, and there will just be a general gift of prophecy he's given out to a handful of people and whoever grabs it first grabs it first um i have been in groups of people where i knew i had a word from the lord and someone else gave it before i did and it's the same word and after it was given i realized well i don't have to give it now because they just gave it right. well why did god give it to me too well i don't know ask god i have no idea why he does that but sometimes he does so there's no need for me to speak too are you following also he says let it be by two or at most by Three. So if somebody, if, if two or three people have already spoke, maybe the second and the third person weren't even led by God. They just spoke thinking they were led. And I really did have a gift. Still, Mark, keep your mouth shut. Three people have already spoke. Trust that the Holy Spirit will say what he needs to say through the person leading us, our shepherd, our leader, or whatever. Okay? Because he says, let it be by two or at what? Most. Most. That means not most plus one. It means most. If three people have already spoke, shut up. Are you following? Because that's what at most means, right? <laughs> we do follow those words, right? So I mean, so even if two or three people have spoke, you could have three people speak supposedly by the Spirit, and all three of them were wrong. And God didn't speak at all. God didn't say, let two or three speak, but only if it's absolutely, we know for a fact it was a gift. It says, let two or three people speak, period. Beyond that, let's just draw a line here, right? Because he starts off with a rhetorical question. Is it really possible that every one of you has got a psalm? Every one of you has got a teaching? Every one of you has got this? Every one of you has got that? Come on. Right? right? And then he goes on to this and he starts talking about two at most by three when it comes to do with prophecy. Two are at most by three, tongues and interpretation. Two at most by three if you're giving psalms and praise and teaching, that kind of thing. So if three people have already spoke and I've still got something in my heart, Mark needs to just say, you know what? Spirit, I'm trusting you. You deal with this. So does that answer your question? Yes. Even if it's a different. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. It doesn't make any difference. Just trust the Spirit of God. And, you know, there are now, God has, God makes his own rules. So, you know, there are, there, that does not mean that a person could not raise their hand and say, you know, uh, like in our church, uh, Brother Mark, I, I feel like the Lord's given me something, but three people have already spoken. And I don't want to give it at a turn. Is it okay that I give it or would you rather me just stay silent? And then trust that the Lord's going to lead me. I could be wrong. 
in what I say. But then it's on me. It's not on you anymore, right? God's going to look at me, the head, and say, Mark, why did you give them authority to do that? Or Mark, or, or kudos, good job. I would have allowed them to do it too. Are you following? Yeah. So, but, the, but see, what does that do? It follows decency and order, right? And it honors the heads, right? Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, but above anything else, I, like I said last week, the big deal is that Jesus Christ is always glorified and honored, and we have to trust that the Spirit of God is going to speak to us regardless. If I have a, 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 a message in tongues or a message in prophecy or a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, whatever, and it doesn't get to come through me, I have to trust that God is going to lead whoever is leading in that service to speak it through them. Because i got to believe that the Holy Spirit wants to give it more than I want to give it, or he wouldn't have given it in the first place, right? So I just trust. This is where, this is part of, believe it or not, it's a very practical example of walking by faith. Do we really trust him? Is he really in control of his body? Does he really want the benefit? Is it really just Paul or is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit who wants the church to be edified? If it's re if the reason why Paul wanted it is because the Spirit wants it, well then even today, 2,000 years later, if we don't, or we're not able to give it, the Holy Spirit see to it that it is given. Isn't that right? And we just trust that he's leading his church. Amen. So, uh, and that also speaks to each, not just women, but all the people in the church that we just settle our hearts before God. Because this secondary partial meaning or nuance of the word silent just means to be at inner peace. Right? So, uh, so the, now, now we need to address the question, who is Paul addressing by the words, your women? Uh, well, these verses, uh, on one level, it appears to be addressing wives for several reasons. Um, two of which I'm going to address today. One is, it says, be submissive as the law says. And I only know of two passages in the Old Testament where, um, where um, this phrase or something like it is brought up. And that's in Genesis 2.18 and Genesis 3.16. And it could be argued that both of those are in the context of marriage. It could be argued. I didn't say it's right. I said it could be argued. Are you following me? Okay. So in Genesis 2.18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper. That shows submission, doesn't it? Yeah. The helper is not the lead. The lead's the lead. The helper's the helper. Right? Yeah. So he says, I'll make a helper comparable to him. So there's a submissive passage. Chapter 3, verse 16 to the woman, this is at now that verse in 218 was before the fall. It was even before her creation, right? 316, not too far away, is after her creation and after the fall. Okay? It says, To the woman, he said, I will grow greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband or toward your husband, and he shall rule over you. Well, this is definitely in the context of marriage. Okay? So at least the second one is in the context of marriage. The first one may or may not be. Okay, you guys following me? And, and they're the only two places that... So why are we looking at those passages? Because says, the reason why I want your women to remain silent is because, they are to, and is because they are to be submissive as the law says. Well, if I want to know what women he's talking about, I need to find out where in the law does it say that they need to be submissive. Are you following? So I can find out who the audience is. Is everybody with me or not? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense? So that's why we went to, these are the only two passages I could think of. And the, every commentator I could reference, most of them could only think of one or the other of these passages. So these are the only two passages I could think of. Okay? But clearly they were there and they do address something. The second one is a phrase in this passage in 1 Corinthians 14 that tells us who we might be talking about. It says, let them ask their own husbands at home. Which, by the way, could correspond to the words, your women. Yeah. Your women, your husband. Right? right? So it could be that he's talking specifically to wives. So, we need to go a little bit further in Genesis 2.18 to solidify this and tack it down. So, um, let's do that. Uh, we'll read it again. Uh, and we need to determine, what we're determining here is, is God speaking just to Eve as a wife or about Eve as a wife or is he speaking to Eve as a woman? Are you following me? Yeah. Because she played two different roles, didn't she? Yeah, she, she did. wasn't just a wife. She was also a woman on her own account, wasn't she? Yeah. Right? She didn't need Adam to be a woman. Yeah. Did she? God just made her one, right? 
Now, she happened to be Adam's woman, but that's a secondary issue. Are you following? Yeah. So is God in Eve, in, second, in Genesis 2.18, speaking to Eve as wife or woman? That's what we need to look at. The wording says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. So who's the topic here? Man, man is, right? Yeah. I will make him a helper comparable to him. He shows up three times in this verse. She shows up once. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Okay, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper, there she shows up, comparable to him. Him, 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 her. Right? So this is clearly verses about Adam, isn't it? Yeah. So now, if I'm going to find out what this is talking about, now I need to find out, not do I, not only do I need to find out is God just talking about Adam, Eve as wife, I need to know whether God's talking about Adam as husband or as man. Are you following me? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the whole per clearly the focus of the verse is man. Yeah. Did anybody pick that up as we read it or not? Yeah. Can yes. we ask a question? Now? Sure, yes. The way, the way, exact way that this is worded, to, at least in my brain, mm -hmm. is, um, yes, he will make him a helper mm -hmm. comparable to him. He has not yet given her chance. So when yeah. she arrives, when he's, she's created, mm -hmm. she's just a woman mm -hmm. until God gives her to Adam. Adam. Okay. So... It would seem to you that this is talking to Eve as a woman. Both. Yeah, well, I, I think it I think it does apply to both. Okay. I agree. I agree with you. So let's go forward. Um, so we have to now now our question has been changed a little bit. Is God speaking to is God saying that um uh, and I, I wrote it out here and I, I worded it pretty well if I can remember where where I put it. Um well since Eve's uh, purpose and uh okay yeah, pr here we see that her purpose is inexorably tied to her function. Her purpose is a helper. That's also her function, right? Now, is he saying that this is true about just wives, or is he saying this about women in general? Does this mean that women were created to help men, or only that wives were created to help their husbands? Well, since Eve's purpose and her function were tied to Adam, we need to determine was God referring to all men in Adam or only future husbands? So let's see that, uh, uh, rather than me having to just try to figure that out, let's let Paul answer the question for us, because he does. Whew. Right? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. You can be the bad guy. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let Paul interpret Genesis 2, 18 for us. Are you seeing how we're, are you also learning how we study scripture? Yeah. We allow scripture to interpret scripture. Correct. If Mark does it, he's got a good chance of being wrong, right? right. <laughs> but if we allow Paul to do it, I'm pretty sure we're in good ground, right? If Jesus does it, we're on good ground. So Paul says it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and verse 3. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of... Every man is Christ, the head of woman. Now, in the Greek again, every is implied because it's already been said. Yeah. Okay? The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So clearly, the head applies to whether you're married or not. He's not, because he's not saying God is the head of every husband, but not every man. Is he? No. no. No, he's clearly talking about all men. Yeah. He's also saying here about women, he's not just talking about wives, he's talking about men in general. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, uh, that, that they are subject to mankind. Yeah. Okay, you following? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty clear. So let's begin with this first example. Is God the head of every man or just husbands? Well, I think we've concluded that he's the head of every man. So with these interpretive verses to go by, what would be your determination? Is God speaking to wives only in Eve, or is he speaking to women in general in Eve? I think he's talking to women in general. So if we go, uh, we keep on reading in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 4 through 12. And we will refer to this again later, but we're going to just read it now. Let every man praying or prophesying, having a, every man praying or prophesying with his, having his head covered, or in other words, having long hair, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. 
Well, he already designed, he already said who the heads were. The head for man that he's dishonoring, he's dishonoring God. Right. But if a woman does this, she's she's dishonoring the entire male gender. <coughs> Hello? Yeah. Not just her husband's or her father, but the entire male gender. Are you following? Yes. He says, For if a woman is uh, for if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it's shameful for a woman to be sh shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. You notice here he doesn't say wives are the glory of their husband. That is also a truth, like you were pointing out. But it means woman was created for a man. And as man is the glory of God, woman is the glory of man. Now, remember, remember what we sang this morning. To you alone, glory, right? So whether or not we immediately like what we read, we recognize that every single thing that God created, he created to illustrate how glory belongs to him. Right. Amen? Right. The, 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 one, the, the, the one created for is always the one giving glory to the one for whom they were created, right? Man was created for God. And so therefore, man is God's glory. Woman was created for man. Therefore, woman is man's glory. Are you following? Yes. It's very clear. I mean, I didn't write these words. I didn't think in your Bibles uh, last night when you were sleeping and write the words in there. They're right there, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, so he says here, now does that mean women cannot glorify God? Of course not. As a body of Christ, every member in the body of Christ can glorify God. He's saying in their role, as gen a gender-specific role, they were created to give glory to mankind. Man was created the glory back to God. All of mankind does glorify God, but in their gender-specific role, a male is created to give glory directly back to God. Women are, give, are created to give glory directly back to man. Uh, are you following? In the same way that if I glorify Christ, I am glorifying the Father, aren't I? If a woman glorifies man, she's also glorifying God. Are you following? To glorify the lesser is to glorify the greater. Now he says here, in verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For, now there's a lot of for statements here, and if you'll spend time with them, you'll understand a lot concerning this topic. He's saying, this is true because, and this is true because, and this is true because. Are you following? Mm -hmm. So when he says for, he says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For... Man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but women were created for men. Well, that's pretty clear there. Yeah. Isn't it true? Yes. He says, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Now, what was he talking about when he started this whole subject? Praying and prophesying in the assemblies. She should have a symbol of authority on her head when she does that. Not because her words are not welcome before the throne of God. In fact, they're required. God wants to hear the voice of his daughters. Amen? And the body of Christ is edified by their voice. Amen? Men and women alike are glorified and blessed by their words. Amen? But there's a proper and an improper way to do it. And we present ourselves as people under authority. Amen? All of us. Men and women both. Yes? Okay? So nevertheless, neither he goes on and he says... Nevertheless, neither is man independent of the woman, nor the woman independent of, of, uh, um, of man in the Lord. For as women came from man, even so man comes through woman. Isn't that true? Adam was not taken from Eve's rib. No, it was the other way around. Woman came from man. But every man that's been born after that came through woman. Amen? So we're not independent from one another. We're interdependent on one another. Are you following? Yes. There's beauty and there's symmetry here. <laughs> we we, we complement one another. We are not in competition with one another. Amen? Yes. The, as soon as we start making it about me, about I, and become competition, it becomes cancerous and becomes deadly. And automatically it speaks to our value then. But realize our value is not being addressed here. Our value is secure. We, all of us, not just men, he said, let us make mankind in our image. Amen? Yes. Male and female, he created them in the image of God. There's your value. Right. 
It's the same for a man as it is for a woman, the same for the woman as it is for the man. Our value is the image of God. Amen? Amen. That doesn't change. Our role, <laughs> specific to our gender, does change things, but does not change our value. Are you following? This is so very important. I know I've spent time with this in the past, but whenever I bring it up, I want to say it again. It can't be overstated, in my opinion. Now, these words are universal. They are not limited to married people only. Men, a man is not from woman as a source, but woman is from man as a source. Notice that God created woman for man, not man for woman. From this, Paul shows that women have been delegated a support role for men, not a leadership role for them. The fact that Paul shows this, uh, shows this, um, and shows that this impacts not only home life but worship, which he is doing here, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's saying that this, the created order, not only applies to the home but it applies to the church. He's showing that, in other words, this speaks to life in general, not just to the marriage. Isn't that very clear? The very fact that he's bringing it up in, in, in relative to the church, he's bringing it up in the assemblies, isn't he? So it's not just talking about in the home. It's talking about everywhere. Now, secondarily, uh, it's not as important of a point, but uh, it is a point, and I kind of made it already, and that is that there needs to be a symbol of authority. What that symbol is can be cultural. In some, in some uh, societies, it's a, a woman wears a veil. In other societies, they might wear a ring that shows, you know, I belong to him. But it's not just the ring, it's how they act when they're wearing it, right? Yeah. You know, if they're always walking ahead of their husband and he's always trying to chase after her and she's always the one gabbing and he doesn't say anything and uh, she's the one always representing the family and he doesn't represent the family, then there's a problem there. He's not the head. Are you following? She's supposed to support and help, not be the lead that he follows. Yes or no? Yes. I mean, this is real clear in Scripture. We don't have to go out of our way to find this. So looking back at our passage again, I think that it's fair a fair-minded person would have to come down on the side of uh, that God is, in fact, addressing all women and Eve, not just wives. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what is being implied in these statements? Women are to help and support men in their work to be a companion and a friend. Um, uh, let me just say this as an exhortation to women, and I've done this once before in here, back literally, um, in 2010, uh, it, it, wow, that's funny because it may actually, I have to look that up, Terry, because I actually said it in March of 2010. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird that I'm bringing it up in March of 2018. Anyway, um, everything in your life should be measured by this and the ways in which scripture tell you that they are lived out. If the Bible makes it clear that something is gender specific and that God created you for this purpose, I would be tap dancing on that and make it my job to live inside those parameters. Because it's only in that right there that I can glorify God. If I go outside of it, I'm not glorifying him. Right. Is everybody following me? Yeah. You take a fish outside of water and it's not living in its function unless it's feeding you. It has one place it belongs, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't intended to survive in the desert. It was designed to flourish in the water, wasn't it? Right? Well, the same thing is true with man and woman. There's a place in which we were created to flourish, and there's a ways in which we were not created to flourish. Right? And we can see this in today's society. Uh, um, uh, you, you, I was just saw um, something yesterday or the day before where they were giving a comparison. You've seen these comparisons before, both on the news and probably on a, uh, not so much on the news because it's very liberal, but on Facebook and places like that. It'll show, um, you know, uh, a man of 19 back in World War II, what they were like, and a man today at 19. And they're radically different. Mm -hmm. A man back then at 19 had already been in war, has already dropped bombs on people he's never met, has been in hand-to-hand -hand combat, has had to defend an entire infantry with the machine gun at his own peril. And he knows what it's like to be cold, to be starving, to be uh, to, uh, to have to, you know, to exist for the benefit of another person without needing a safe place and a blanket and a, and a, and a, and a binky in his mouth, right? Yeah. And you got the guys now, there are 19 years in America, and you can't say boo without them crying in a corner um, and needing therapy. There's clearly a problem here. Would you agree with me? Yes. That's not, that is not man operating where God placed them. Amen? And nobody is glorified by that. In fact, the sad thing is they don't even have the common sense to be ashamed of it. Now, 
It's clear that these instructions are not just for the married, but are integrated into our design. Rebellion towards these standards is rampant in our world, so much so that even level-headed sinners can see that it's out of balance. I've, I don't know how many people I've talked to that I know for a fact do not know Christ, and they can look at the movies, the entertainment, and the way that our, our laws are aiming towards the exaltation of women and the debasement of men, and they think it's absolutely insane. Right. We're talking about lost people can even tell this. Right. As long as you're somewhat level-headed and can look at life and say, that just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, it, clearly this is running headlong in the wrong direction. Last night, and this was certainly, I promise you, was not, there's no way I could have made this happen, but it just happened to happen right at the right time, the day before I taught on this topic. Um, last night, Tara and I were at Publix, and I went, and I could not get the dumb machine to work for filling our water. So I had to go into the customer service line and get change because they won't take my dollar. It wasn't crisp enough. So I had to get um, change. So I went to customer service in Publix. And as I was um, leaving, I looked back and there is a man who's probably in his late 70s dressed in a blue dress, wearing a doily type of shawl over his shoulders, pumps and the whole nine yards, standing in line. Oh, my gosh. And I am. So, yes, I'm serious. serious. I just can't. Yeah, yeah, I understand because, you, you, but the bottom line is it was, it's right there. Okay. And, and nobody dared give him a second glance because they don't want to be labeled. They're scared to death. But I promise you, 90% of the people that saw him thought, freak, what the heck's wrong with you? Right. But they would never have said it because it's not culturally, culturally acceptable, right? But, you know, if someone had done that 50 years ago, he probably wouldn't have gotten in the front door. He certainly wouldn't have been served. What costume party did you go to? Yeah. You know, and immediately when I saw that, a verse sprung to mind, and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, it says, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do such a thing are an abomination to the Lord. Right. We turn it into something that's fun at a party, and God says, it's not funny. There's nothing funny about that. That's sick, yeah. and it's an abomination to me. It's not just funny, it's, it's uh, becoming the law. It, yeah, it is. Okay. But, but you can see how, it, I've actually been at Christian parties where men dressed up as a woman. And they thought it was funny, because it's just a costume party. But my God says, no, I'm sorry, that's an abomination to me. Yeah. Don't ever do it, not even in fun. Yeah. Don't do it. Right? right? And yet, but see, Christians don't know what the Bible says, and quite frankly, don't care enough to look. Isn't it true? Yeah. Ultimately. Now, why does God feel so passionately about this? Because he put the gender roles where they are to glorify him. And when you blend them, you do not glorify him. In fact, you rebel against him and you distort his image. That's why it's sin. It distorts the image of God. It's lying about your creator. That's why it's wrong. Now, is, this just, now, is it just clothes that God's concerned about? Or does it, the statement speak to a deeper concern of God's? I think it's because God is saying you're blurring gender lines and distorting my image. Mm -hmm. So go back to 1 Corinthians 14 again. Even if it could be argued that this is just talking to wives specifically, clearly the reasons that Paul gave are based upon truths that are incumbent upon all women. Isn't it true? Mm -hmm. So in the end, does it really matter if he's really talking to just wives or not? <laughs> not really, because the rules apply regardless. Now, the second word that we need to look at is the word speak. We looked at the word silent, now we're looking at the word speak. Um, this is the word laleo, it's L-A-L-E-O, and it appears quite a bit in this chapter, and it can be a little complicated to interpret. Standing alone without a context, it simply means to talk at random, as contrasted with the Greek word lego, which um, involves intellectual part of man, his reasoning. So laleo is especially used of children who talk a lot, just rambling on incessantly about nothing, okay? So it's, that's, it's also used in reference to tongues, because to the listener, it sounds like you're rambling about nothing. Laleo, it's incomprehensible, right? And so when he says, I do, it's not permitted to them to speak, it, uh, one of the way, the, the, the straight up meaning of that word laleo is to just speak incomprehensibly like a child is rambling on and on. But... This word is a special word because it is controlled by the context. 
It can mean that if it stands alone. If it's in a particular context and it's got qualifiers, then it takes on a different meaning. That's the case here. The word laleo here means that speaking is referring to something he just demonstrated a few verses before. In other words, the word speak doesn't mean speak altogether. It means the kind of speaking I just talked to you about. Okay? Now, now you, again, you have to be very careful when you're interpreting languages because languages, words mean something radically different based on how they're used, yeah. right? Yeah. In this case, he's not saying, I don't want women to just ramble on about nothing because if that's what he meant, he would have said men too. Yeah. It wouldn't be proper for a man or a woman to just ramble on about nothing, right? That would be not decent, and it would not be orderly, <laughs> right? So there's nothing about female that would mean that they alone couldn't do that. But the word actually literally means, and I don't want women, it is not permitted to women to speak in the way that I just talked about. So what did he just talk about? That's one of the things we need to look at. Paul was talking about maintaining order while using the gifts, and he had provided two examples of this. The first was tongues with interpretation, and the second was prophecy. Um, so far, we know Paul has, up to this point, never told women that they cannot give a message or an interpretation in tongues, and we know for a fact that he supports them prophesying. So clearly, it's not prophecy in itself that he says women cannot do. We know that. Did we not already read verses this morning where, where Paul supported women prophesying in the church? As long as they represented some type of symbol of authority, they were a woman under authority, prophecy was perfectly acceptable in the assemblies for a woman. So it can't be talking about that. So what else did he just mention? Well, he mentioned a particular type of talking which has to do with judging prophecy. Judging prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. That requires authority. A woman can prophesy, but a woman in the church cannot stand up and say, what you just said is not correct. Because that requires authority. Now, how do we know that? Well, because Paul has already addressed authority issues in other letters. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 2. I told you we're going to go there again. Didn't I say that earlier? Yeah. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go back there real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 2, looking at 8 through verse 14. Paul addresses authority here. I will not, he says, I let your women keep silent in the church. In other words, let them hold their tongue and remain in inner peace. Because it is not permissible for a woman to speak in the way that I just talked about. In other words, judge prophecy in the assemblies. Mm -hmm. But it's to be submissive. So I already knew in reading the verse that whatever kind of speaking, it was non-submissive. It had to be. Because he pits it against, but are to be submissive. Mm -hmm. So whatever speaking had to be not submissive. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of obvious in the wording? Yeah. Yes or no? Does that yes. make Does everybody follow me or not? Yes. That verse says... That let your women keep silent in the churches, for it's not permitted for them to speak, but to remain in submission. But in submission follows don't speak. So the kind of speaking has got to be non-submissive speaking. It has to be. And the context alone tells us that. Well, the only thing Paul has brought up so far that would have been prohibited to a woman is the authoritative action of deciding and coming down authoritatively whether prophecy was right or not. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves with modest apparel. Blah, blah, blah. Skip on down to verse 11. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Now I want you to see how these two verses compare with one another. In, ch in chapter 14, he says, If a woman wants to learn, let her ask. Here he says, I want a woman to learn. But in both places, it's in silence. Yes? Yeah. But, but you notice that learning is mentioned in both places. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. It says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Submission is mentioned in both verses, isn't it? Yeah. And I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, so clearly the word silence used here means to be inwardly calm. Don't assert yourself. Don't overreach your boundaries. Right? And now he gives us a reason for it. He says, because Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now, we already addressed the issue that he wasn't talking about husbands and wives. He talked about men and women. Right? And this is, you notice, he, in talking about forming, he's not talking about after they committed sin. This is not a result of the fall. 
This has to do with the order of creation. No one has fallen yet, have they? He said Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's the reason why one is submissive to the other. In other words, Paul saying God intended and was saying something when he made Adam first. Now, he could have just as well made woman first. It's not who he made. For all I know, it was, a, it was a kind of a flip of the coin. I know it wasn't because he put character traits in men that exemplify the father, which is God, God, why God is called the father and not the wife and not the mother. You know, the Bible doesn't ever call God the mother. Right. <laughs> He's called the father. Why is it a gender-specific term? Because of the fact that in man, God, rep God represents himself the clearest as the Father in his role there, right? The Holy Spirit is very clearly referenced in women. Can you look at the Holy Spirit and say the Holy Spirit has less significance than the Father? No! You can't do without either one of them. Isn't it true? Absolutely! But out of the two, who is always giving glory to who? The Spirit's always giving glory to the Father. Right? You see, so all these things are painting a picture, aren't they? They intend to represent something. They're saying something. God made man. Right? Then he made woman for man. Right? So, we've already pointed out that these words have a point. Let the women learn in silence with all submission, and, do not, and I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So these are five points that are brought up here is learn in silence, learn in all submission. That's our word hupotasso, to willingly place yourself under. It is a very specific word, women. God is not saying that you need to be in that position because you're incapable of doing anything else. He's saying because you are just as capable as men, you've got to determine to place yourself under. That's what the word hopotasso means. It means to voluntarily place yourself under. It's got nothing to do with rank, importance, or power. Well, it does have something to do with delegated yeah. power, but it doesn't have anything to do with ability. He's not saying it's because you're incapable and stupid. It's because of the fact that this is the created order and I've delegated it the way, the way I have. If he meant the other, there's another Greek word that would have better suited it. Hupotasso means to voluntarily place yourself under. It doesn't mean you were created as only able to be under. You could be ahead if you chose to. But if you're going to honor God, you have to willingly place it. In other words, God gave women ability to do things that he doesn't want them to do. Why? Because otherwise there would be no free will. You'd be doing it because you had to. You had no choice. Yes? Yes. Hupotasso shows a willingness to surrender <laughs> abilities that I otherwise would have. Yeah. It's not that a woman can't do it. It's that, that she shouldn't do it. Yeah. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Yes. This is why the teaching about women for generations was dead wrong. Because they always would go from a verse like this and run right to Peter where, said, where Peter said that the woman is the weaker vessel. And they would apply that to mentally and to with skills and with this and that. And Paul, Peter wasn't even talking about that. He literally meant physically weaker. Well, that's, that's obviously true. I mean, now, are there cases where you're going to have a pencil of a guy and a woman who's been working out? Yes. But you put a man and a woman who are equally healthy in a gym, and they both do the same workout regimen, inside of a month, he'll be twice as big, if not three times bigger than she is, and three times stronger. Every time. Not sometimes. Every time. Why? Because he was created that way. He's rep representing the Father. Amen. Now, is it because she could not work out long enough to be as strong as him? No, it's not about ability. Is everybody still following me, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. If we teach that it's about ability, we're dead wrong because God never said that. The word hupotasso can't mean that. It says never teach a man. Now, that is altogether different than teaching your boy children at home or even boy children at a church, probably. Okay? Yeah. He's saying other men, right? Yeah. I don't permit for them to teach men. And the word authority here means to act like a governor over a man. Lord, have I seen that? <laughs> Women interrupt their husband in the middle of their sentence and try to finish all the, his thoughts and never let... I'm not saying that every once in a while a woman can't, you know, can't butt up and say if he's stammering through his words and finish his sentence. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not, that's not showing disrespect. 
but a woman who's always cutting him off, won't let him finish a sentence, always filling his words for him. So I don't care if he's allowing you to do it. I don't care if he asked you to do it. It's wrong. Hello? Yeah. He's the head. He's the head for a reason, right? Yeah. Jesus does not stand up in front of God and say, shut, shut up, here, let me finish your words for you. <laughs> Could you ever see Jesus doing that to the Father? Never. No. Would you ever see the Holy Spirit doing that to Jesus? Never. Never. Absolutely not. Well, see, why is that? Because one has been placed over and the other has been placed under. Now, in the Godhead, is it because, is because somehow Jesus is less than God, God no. the Father? No. Is that why he hupotassos? No, he hupotassos, in, in fact, the whole purpose and ability to hupotasso is because they're equals. Right. Amen? Yeah. But he places himself under. <coughs> Amen? Thank you, Jesus, for such a beautiful illustration. He will forever be so and forever he will do so. Now, I have in your little outlines some examples I'm not going to go through for time's sake, okay? But I wanted to illustrate it for you. You can see it in, I, I don't remember how I put it on your outline because my outline is different. But I talk about examples of how um, uh, authority in regard to women is used and how the role of a woman in not only in a marriage but also in greater society are illustrated by the lives of women in the New Testament and the Old. Okay, an example of power gone the wrong way was um, uh, um, Queen um, Athelia, who is mentioned in 2 Kings 11 and in 2 Chronicles 22. She was never placed in that power, she grabbed it, and the men in that society did nothing about it but followed her lead. Eventually, Destruction was coming down on Israel because a woman was leading them. And God, through a prophet, led them to pull her out of the kingdom and kill her in front of everybody. Yeah. And then a rightful heir was placed there. Yes. It was improper for her to be in that position. Yeah. Uh, we see in another passage in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, Childish leaders oppress my people and women rule over them. Oh, my people, your leaders are misleading you. They send, uh, they send you down the wrong road. Who did he say, who did he say their leaders were? Childish. Women. He said they're childish, but they're women. Right? He said they're leading you down the wrong road. Why? Because they were not intended to lead. They're just intended to be the helper of the one who is leading. Remember, that wasn't just relegated to God. Wasn't just, remember, we attached the fact that Paul made it real clear. We're not just talking about wives. We're talking about women. We're not just talking about husbands. We're talking about men. Right? Yeah. There's a right and a wrong way to do things. Now, is society going to run the opposite direction? Well, every time they are, because they are the world. But we don't worry with the world. What we are concerned about is how do I act as a member of God's body? Amen? Yeah. That is what matters. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's what I support. You can also see the lives of Miriam and Deborah and Hulda, all Old Testament women, all of which respected male authority, loathed the idea of supplanting men's rightful position, even in the most... A uh, garish one that you can find, which is Deborah. Deborah said out of her own mouth that I don't want to do this because if I do this, the glory that belongs to you as a man will fall on me, a woman. Yes. She said that out of her own mouth. Yes. So she knew her place. Yeah. But was she still a prophetess in Israel? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. God placed her in that position. But prophetesses and prophets have no authority. If you were to look at Huldah, and look these verses up, look them up yourself. Huldah was also a prophetess. Miriam was a prophetess. But who did she lead in prophecy and worship? The women, yeah. didn't she? Yeah. Miriam. Remember that? We read that in Exodus. She ran out ahead and began to prophesy and sing in prophecy with all the women, and they danced with timbrels and cymbals and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Now, 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 that does not mean that women prophesy just to women. They prophesy to everybody, male and women alike, right? Because prophecy doesn't carry authority. If you, and that is probably seen no clearer than with Hulda, if you look her up. If you look up her, you'll find that she was a real prophetess in Israel. But when what she said was said, the only person that could make it happen was the king, who was a male. Are you following? Yeah. Look up the examples yourself. Don't take my word for it. <clears throat> so, Paul says the two reasons here that he gave, if we're reading that passage in Timothy, he says, because Adam was formed first, then Eve, 
And then Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So he gives two reasons. The first one was created order. The second one was deception. I'm just breezing through this for time's sake because I don't have time to get, and I, I don't, there's not a whole lot of need to get bogged down in it anyway because we have spent time with this in the past. But I do want to just hit a few high points, okay? So you guys still tracking with me for a moment? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. All right. Man, not, um, Paul says that this was intended and stood for something that was important, that, uh, um, that men were in the position of being in the, in the leadership role. If women were designed to help men, then men must, buy, must be designed by God to be the ones leading, the ones with the mission that needs aid. <laughs> it does not matter where you go or what time period you visit, overwhelmingly, this is always true in every culture. In t unless you're in a culture that is um, like America, that has become so f personal freedom oriented that their lines begin to get, their gender lines begin to get blurred. But if that does not happen, automatically in every nation throughout the history of this planet, men are always in authority. It always happens that way. It always happens that way. And it's not always because men are bigger and stronger. It's just because it's just the way that's assumed. It's just known. It's instinctively built into us. They know it. And uh, it's also true when it comes to do with, do you realize that nearly every major industry known to men, men excel above women? In virtually every single thing. And I'm, not, I'm not just talking about in architects and engineers and scientists. You kind of expect that. But I just did a quick Google search last night and I was just oh, blown away blown away every time I looked something up. The top 10 fashion designers on this planet, seven out of 10 are men. Yeah. Interior decorators, seven out of 10 of the best on the planet are men. Yeah. Bakery chefs, 10 out of 10 are men. Yeah. Makeup artists, five out of 10 are men. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, Again, is this because women are incapable? No. That's why they show up on the list. They're perfectly capable. It's just not the right order. Are you following me? It's because that's not the way they're created to do. They were created to help. Now, and how could they help if they didn't have some of these same skills themselves? They couldn't. They would be useless. You'd need another man. <laughs> right? Clearly, they have skill. Clearly, they have creative abilities. Clearly, they are strong in areas where the man is weak. Or they could be no, of no help, right? Yes. Amen? Yeah. So clearly, is, is it a surprise that they show up at all on these lists? No. But is it also any surprise that men have a tendency to excel in all these fields? No. Uh -uh. You, you'll find some noteworthy, brilliant female scientists out there. Brilliant engineers. Brilliant in any field. But by and large, you'll find it is dominated in almost every one of them by men. And the best in industry will almost always be men. Why? Because God has placed his authority there. That's where he placed it. Do you you're realize, not, huh? You're not saying that women cannot hold these positions in science and stuff. No, I'm not saying that. Okay. Um, particularly, particularly if they are playing what God intended them to play, and that's a support role. They've got to be in the industry to influence it, don't they? Yes. I mean, I, if, I, if, if I'm going to influence, uh, if God has called me, uh, uh, called a woman in the support role of, of aiding mankind, men in their lead in science, she has to be a scientist, doesn't she? Yeah. Right? Now, this does become uh, treading into tricky waters, and we'll probably wind up showing a video next week that will, and we'll probably, next week will probably be a very easy week because. Number one, this week was a little harder than normal, um, but we'll probably play a video and then open up to questions um, uh, because there's going to probably be a lot of them because the truth of the matter is the body of Christ done right looks radically different than the world. And the world will look at us and think we're Amish. And there's a reason for that because the Amish, they're overly strict and they keep the letter of the law to the point of interpreting the law in ways it was never intended to be interpreted. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they are often closer to the truth of God's word than the average Christian is. Yeah. So we need to see how is it really played out. Because there are times when a career is inappropriate, particularly for a married woman. Her role is very clear in Scripture. And we'll address that probably next week, not this week. Okay? 
because it's not directly de uh, dealing with this, because we want to just finish this passage, and I want to make sure that we address those things. I also um, have in your list, I think, um, uh, examples of how single women fulfill this function and how married women fulfill this function. Is that in your, um, yes. your list? Okay, so you might want to spend some time with that, and we'll address it next week. But the way single women fulfill it, in brief, is they play support roles. You'll see a number of them follow Jesus around in his ministry, and they supplied food for him. They cooked for the disciples. They mended their clothes. Some of the women uh, were, um, were widowed, or some of them um, uh, later on with the apostles were Gentiles, and therefore in their societies, in Gentile societies, they, some of those women were business women who were not married, and they would support the apostles financially. Okay, but their but their role was always a support one, not a lead one. They were not out there preaching the gospel. They were helping and freeing the hands of the apostles to preach. Are you following? And you'll find that consistent all the way through Scripture. All right, whether you're dealing with apostles in the New Testament or Old Testament prophets or whatever you're dealing with. Um, so, in closing, let's look at for the last few verses. Let's look at the last for a few verses. Paul asks the question, after he says, um, um, if they want to learn something, let their ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for women in the ch to speak in the church. Again, I've told you this before, and I'll just speak it to you here real quickly, that, the, uh, again, if Paul were speaking specifically to women here that were wives, then that would be a good reason to bring up husbands. But you have to understand that Paul has spoken to these people. In the same letter, did we not see that he was drawing out authority? And headship. We saw in, in uh, just three chapters before this one in chapter 11, he addresses it in the same letter, doesn't he? Yes? Yeah. So in other words, by extension, he means whoever their head is. If they are still a young woman at home or an older woman who's just never married but is still in her father's house, then let her ask her father at home. Let her ask her brothers at home. In other words, let them ask whoever is their male authority at home. And I, so, I mean, if you're in a church, and again, in reference to what? A prophecy just took place. And they have a question as to whether or not that was accurate. I don't think that was accurate. He says, I don't, it's not proper for a woman to judge that. If they've got a question about it and they want to learn anything about that, let them ask their husbands or let them ask their, their fathers or let them ask their brothers at home. Let them ask their spiritual head. What if they don't have any of those and they're, they're just a widowed woman who has no uh, relatives? It's very clear in Scripture. Let them ask their elders. Hello? Yeah. But it says if they've got a question about that, which is the topic, judging prophecy. They, they hear the prophecy they think, I don't think that could be right. It's not your place to say so. Bring it to someone in who is an authority, who's your head afterwards, and ask. If they want to learn something, let them ask. Are you following? It doesn't mean if they want to learn anything in the Bible, they have to learn it from their husbands. It doesn't mean that. It's talking about this particular thing. All right? In closing, he says, he asks rhetorical questions. Or did the word of God just come to you guys alone? Or did it spring out of your church alone? In other words, the fact that you guys even, I have to write this to you, tells me there's a certain amount of arrogance in your church, in the church of Corinth. And he's saying, you know, did the word of God come to you originally? Or, 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 or is, it, is it just to you that it was spoken? If anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge what I'm writing to you are not just my words, but the commands of Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, brethren... I want you to earnestly desire prophecy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but let everything be done in decency and in order. So can you see how this chapter addressed those very issues all the way through it? And it's a very important chapter, isn't it? A lot of heady things are dealt with in it. But I think some of them had to be treated a little bit with kid gloves and, and go into with some depth so we understood what they meant. Yeah. But clearly in this passage, that word speak is the key word. So you may want to underline that, put some asterisks on it. In case you don't remember everything I said about it, you can look it up yourself, okay? Because the word speak there can mean just to ramble on about nothing. But if it were talking about that, it would have said it to men as equally as to women, right? Because it would never be appropriate for anyone to do that. Or it can mean not to speak in a way that he just mentioned. Well, in this passage, it has to mean that. And the only thing that he had just mentioned that would have been prohibited to women is authoritative speaking. Prophecy is allowed to them. Interpretation of tongues and tongues is allowed to them, isn't it? The only thing that would have not been allowed to them would have been to judge prophecy in the assembly because that is a role of authority. Is everybody with me? Okay. So um, before we close right now, is there any questions about what we've covered today? Yeah, but I'll ask them later. Okay, the, so far, does it make sense to you? 
Yeah. Does it seem consistent with the whole of Scripture? Yeah. I think it does too. Yeah. Hopefully, we are advanced enough in here that this does not speak to anyone's identity. I pray to God that that's the case. And if you've got a problem with that, come to me. Don't remain silent. Because God makes it clear your identity is Christ himself. Your value yeah. is Christ himself. It's got nothing to do with your delegated roles. Amen? Yeah. That's the whole purpose of the word hopotasso. You have to voluntarily surrender rights, abilities, freedoms, because you have them. Sure. Right? Or you couldn't surrender them. Yes? Well, if we are to, if that's God's goal, is Christ formed in us, that's what Christ did. That's right. I mean, he, he potassoed himself. That's right. I mean, he surrendered all. And every gender has got to do that in one form or another. Yeah. If you are human, you have someone that you hypotasso to. Yeah. Amen. That's right. 